Both of these tests, the Girl Scouts and the PageMaker templates, are great examples of scenarios. To understand why, let's look at the characteristics of scenarios. In software development, a scenario is a story about how somebody uses the program. The scenario test uses the story to evaluate the program. John Carroll lays out several of the key elements of stories that appear in scenarios. Every story has a setting. This includes the computer and the program details, but it also includes the situation of the user. So if the scenario is about a teacher working in a school, the school is part of the setting. The story is usually about people who are trying to achieve goals, but it's also about the reasons they have for wanting to achieve those goals. The story has a plot, but it's not an inflexible plot. You don't have to necessarily stick to an exact script or an exact sequence diagram. People can learn. They can decide to do something a different way. They can abandon trying one way to get to a goal and try something else, a workaround. If it works, maybe it's good enough. So the program can pass the test, even if the tester does it a different way from the way you intended when you designed the test. A good scenario is a story that's credible and motivating. A good scenario test relies on a good scenario, but it's also easy to evaluate and it also involves a complex use of the program. So let's apply this to the postage stamp bug. We do have a straightforward story. Someone wants to create a newsletter and they want to place the logo right there. The story is credible. People will use the program this way. We know that people will use the program this way because we have two people who do. One's a mother who wants to do it with a Girl Scout logo. The other is a newsletter that won a PageMaker Design Award. In this case, we have a motivated person with influence who's going to get the bug fixed. That's the marketing manager. The tester chose this PageMaker example specifically to attract the attention of that person. Now, this started out as a very simple function test. Just take a picture and put it in the corner. It's a boundary case. Normally, you don't take a function test and turn it into a scenario. You don't take a boundary test or a combination of a few variables and turn them into scenarios. It takes time to create these stories. If you just have a simple test, just do it. But in this case, the function test didn't work. They found the bug, but they couldn't persuade the programmers and the project manager to fix the bug. So they said, maybe if we can make a scenario out of this, people will understand why this bug needs to be fixed. So in that case, it turned into a scenario. But the scenario isn't just now put a graphic in a corner. You've got this whole newsletter. Lots and lots of features are involved, including one thing in the corner. Finally, the results of this test are very easy to check. Just compare them with the newsletter that you're trying to duplicate. Now remember, scenario testing is just one technique. We can do lots of techniques. We can do function tests and domain tests and quick tests and scenarios. You don't want to use scenarios for everything. You don't want to have to combine all the other tests into these complex stories. Use them on their own. You use scenarios to reach tasks or benefits or situations that are more complex than you can reach with the simpler tests. One of the key benefits of scenario testing is that it helps you consider what will happen when an experienced user tries to do something challenging with the product. It's much easier to look for bugs that inexperienced users would find because they do relatively simple things. For inexperienced user bugs, you can design your testing around the things that are relatively obvious. The capabilities of the product, the common types of failures, and compatibility with external software and hardware. When someone gets experienced with a product, they use it to do more complex things, and not always things expected by the programmers. It takes more knowledge of the software and much more imagination to test at the level of the experienced user. Scenario testing is a type of combination testing. You test lots of features and lots of data together in every scenario. Now, there are vast numbers of possible combinations to test. What scenario-based thinking provides as a strategy for selecting good combinations is that it goes after meaningful combinations, things that people would care about. The postage stamp bug illustrates one type of scenario test. The example is so clear that many of my students are confused by it. In their final exams, these students tell me that all scenario testing is about finding better failure scenarios for bug reports. But that's not so. Bug follow-up is a very good thing to do, but it's just one special case of scenario testing. In a couple of minutes, we're going to look at another 16 ways to generate scenario tests. But first, we need a reference example. So imagine a program that helps someone find a job. I'll call this the Get a Job program. 
So let's do a scenario analysis with this program. We'll start by listing users. First one is Joe. Joe's a middle-aged executive. As a job seeker, he's a traditionalist. He's used to working with computers, but he's not very comfortable with mobile applications or social networks. He'll do his job hunting by looking at ads in newspapers, by postings on the web. He'll send some unsolicited resumes to some businesses, and he'll work with a recruiter. Then there's Jane, our young networker. She doesn't have much work experience yet. In fact, she could use help figuring out how to highlight her school projects to make them relevant to her search. But she loves her smartphone. She's active on several online networks. She's got about 2,000 contacts. Maybe they can help her get a job. Sarah is an outgoing salesperson. She meets people face to face. She used to sell real estate, but the business changed a lot and she doesn't like it anymore. She doesn't have almost any experience with computers. She relies on meeting people. She meets people at church, at business networking events, at social events, in the grocery store, anywhere. She's very outgoing and she's very organized. Whenever she meets someone, she writes down all their information on little 3 by 5 cards and she has these big boxes of cards at home. But she's been out of work for six months. Her son just bought her a computer in this program to help her restart her job search. Bill's a priest. A lot of people at his church are unemployed. He figured it might be an idea to set up support groups. Three or four people who help each other look for a job, give each other moral support. A local computer store donated some computers and four copies of the Get a Job program, so now they've got a whole center set up for job searchers. Well, I'll stop here, but we could keep going. If you were really testing this program, you should probably be able to list 10 or more very different users. And you focus on each user in turn, asking what they want from the program. Different users have different expectations and needs. For example, Bill the Priest probably wants this program to keep the searches separate for different people so that when he meets with Ralph, he only wants to see Ralph's resume and Ralph's contacts. Jane doesn't care about that, but she does want to aggregate information about a company from all the different sources that she finds on the web. She expects the program to help her organize and store that data. For each person, you can imagine things that are important to them and design tests around those things, probably several tests for each. Notice the difference between this and the bug follow-up scenario. For the bug follow-up, the testers needed one test that would persuasively illustrate one bug. In contrast with the user-focused approach, you might develop dozens of tests for each user. Another way to get test ideas is to watch people doing the kind of work that they'll do with your product. I worked for a telephone company for a while. One of my tasks was to design an operator's console. That's the big phone with a gazillion buttons used by a receptionist or an operator who's going to get hundreds of calls. So I would fly around the country visiting companies that had consoles that were made by other manufacturers. I'd sit for a couple days behind the receptionist and she'd turn around and tell me what she liked or disliked about the system. Every now and again, something would happen that would confuse or irritate the operator. Those all turned into tests of my designs. Hans Bavalda sometimes talks about his experiences visiting client sites. Think of a bank that's redesigning the parts of its system that tellers use. Hans would visit bank branches, and he'd take tellers and managers out for drinks at the local pub. They'd eventually relax, and they'd tell stories about crazy things that would happen in the bank. Now, some of those created inconveniences or unusual problems for the teller or bank manager. Any of those that could possibly involve the software became tests. Now, some of these were pretty extreme, but if anybody ever said, oh, nothing like that can ever happen here, Hans could say, oh yes, it already has happened. We just want things to work better next time. In a transaction processing system, transactions are indivisible operations. The system either completes a transaction or cancels it. For example, in a bank, you can't half open a bank account. You either open it or you don't. So what are all the transactions in your system? You can design scenarios for each one. Elizabeth Hendrickson often analyzes programs by creating sequence diagrams of the part of the system she's working with at the moment. With sequence diagrams, you'd normally create use case level tests, and she often does that. But anytime it's useful, she adds all the human details that transform these into scenarios.